Ready? Two. Sorry. And one. Are we good? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone, thanks for joining us and thanks to HowlRound for hosting us this afternoon. My name is Isaac Poole. I'm the Artist Initiatives Coordinator at Creative Capital. Um, and if you're not already familiar, Creative Capital supports innovative and adventurous artists across the country through funding, counsel, and career development services. Our workshops are developed specifically for artists to provide career, community, and confidence building tools to support all aspects of a creative practice. We offer online and in-person workshops on a wide array of different topics, including communications, financial wellness, long-term planning, resource sharing, and more to help artists build sustainable practices. We also offer the Creative Capital Award annually to artists working across all disciplines. The award provides up to $50,000 in project funding and career development services valued at over $50,000 for a total commitment of over $100,000. The application for the Creative Capital Award is free and opens every February. We're excited to present this extremely timely panel uh, all about live streaming for artists led by 2016 Creative Capital awardee Yara Chavieso and her collaborator Bridget Green. Uh, Yara and Bridget will be joined by uh, Maddie Barber Bockelman of Culture Hub, uh, Vijay Matthew of HowlRound, and video producer Nell Shelby. There's going to be some time for questions at the end of the panel presentations. And if you have anything that you'd like to ask, please reach out to us over Twitter at CreativeCap to join in the conversation. So I'll hand it over to Bridget from here. Thank you, Isaac. Um, also, thank you to Creative Capital and to HowlRound and to all of our panelists and to everybody watching today, too. Um, Yada and I, uh, as Isaac said, we are collaborators on La Madia, and La Madia um, is a uh, immersive musical that is simultaneously the making of a feature film that we live streamed. And I guess about two weeks ago, kind of when all of this started to really, um, everything started to change really quickly. Uh, Isaac reached out to us and had some questions from an artist friend of his, and so. From there, we kind of started thinking, oh, we wanna share some of the tools and some of the things that we have learned in the process of live streaming Medea and also bring together different voices um, and use this as an opportunity to also gather community um, around folks who have been live streaming um, even before uh, we kind of were hit by the coronavirus and use this as an opportunity to talk about what it's like from a creative standpoint and all the way kind of through to a technical standpoint of what it means for you to be able to live stream your work and to also uh, move into this in a way that's not necessarily about productivity or not necessarily about something that has really high stakes, but is in a space that is fun and it's a space that's process oriented, especially um, in this time. So as Isaac said, uh, you'll hear from all of us and then we'll sort of have more of a discussion. And there's also a blog post that we have on Creative Capital's website that has a lot of resources there too. Um, and I think it'll continue to be updated uh, after this. So we hope you can tune in there. And I'm going to pass it off to Yada, uh, my collaborator. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in. I think we have a lot of people. So we're really grateful to have this little one moment in community because a lot of us are isolated by ourselves or with our parents, me. <laughs> so I think it would be great if we just as a community just took a second. Uh, I know that it's a scary time and it's an uncertain time, especially for a lot of artists and for a lot of underrepresented communities already and vulnerable communities. So if we can just take a second and just take a breath in together. Feel our feet on the ground and exhale together. Thank you. And I really think that something that Bridget said was really great. We really wanted to put this together uh, to come together in community, to bring some inspiration and some spaces of creation that maybe we haven't tapped into yet, but this is a really great opportunity to start playing with and also really thinking of this space of live streaming not as another place for productivity like what bridge said but really thinking about live streaming as a place for play a place for experimentation innovation and and really just 
furthering your process or your practice. Personally, I'm playing with it a lot right now to process some of how I'm feeling in a vulnerable way because of the power of live streaming has an ability to have that layer of vulnerability to it and that aspect of intimacy that we don't always get on stage. Background is in theater, I direct live performances and I direct film work. So I wanna talk a little bit about La Medea, which is really, here to give you some inspiration, but this is a project I created before we had all of this happening. So we had resources, we had cameras, we had a lot of other things, but the takeaways of La Medea are really the part that we really wanted to share with everybody because that is, I'm gonna do a little screen sharing right now, that is what we think is inspiring is some of the takeaways that we found in it. So this is a, like Bridget said, a Latin American, uh, Latin disco oh, pop variety it. show. It's an immersive musical that was Life. made for screen and for stage. We bring and so a lot of what the aspects of the, the musical world. were really how to the create foreigner. a world for this woman to sort of break away from the archetypes of the foreign woman of the original Love myth of Medea. So we played with this idea of Greek chorus, having a Greek chorus in the actual theatrical space and the Greek chorus acted as our film extras. But then we had, this is the part that we're really excited about, the Greek chorus that interacted with the musical from afar. So from home, they were watching this live stream television show broadcast and they could send in comments, questions, and eventually those questions would make their way into the musical, into the script and into the character's mouths. So in that way, they really function as a Greek chorus coloring and creating textures to the world. Uh, so this project, something that was really inspiring that we really took away from it was engagement uh, for us, it was important to have audience engagement because it made sense for the story. Um, so it made sense for the story of Medea. And uh, we also realized that so much of the interaction that we were receiving from the audience was really keeping them engaged and keeping them uh, inside the world and inside the narrative in ways that we hadn't experienced in sort of a theater space. So it really opened our eyes into a different way of having this kind of practice and storytelling, having a Greek chorus from beyond really influencing the world and the work was such a fun, spontaneous, creative process because we were making changes on the go. Another aspect of live streaming is I'm sure a lot of people have noticed in Zoom, there's a lot of technical limitations that you have. So something that we were playing with was let's make the technical limitations part of the story. So we would make glitches part of the script. So then when we did have a glitch, we already knew that this was part of the language and it was really playful and fun. So really thinking about the medium and it's limitations more as like uh, the limitations that create spaces of freedom versus spaces of um, you know, blocking any ideas. Uh, we also played with different platforms. So live streaming La Media on Twitch was a very different experience than live streaming it on, for example, on what we're on right now. Uh, when we were doing it on Twitch, it was really much more about interacting with an outside audience. It was about that conversation. We had this one guy just like really commenting on every single thing. He almost became a main character to the story and he wasn't even in the film. He was in the comments all the time. So there was that aspect that was really fascinating. And then there's the aspect of, there was a platform of something like HowlRound that is really functions, and then Vijay can talk more about it, but really functioned much more like a theater venue where we had a dedicated space for Medea, um, almost like a theatrical venue. And the other thing about Twitch was that we were bringing in audiences that were not normally coming into this kind of work. So we had a lot of new viewers to our creative films, these wild experimental films. And that was really exciting because these are voices and minds that we weren't necessarily having conversations with. Um, and then how round was really beautiful because we got to reconnect with our community. So there's so many aspects and we can keep talking about it and answer some questions, but there's so many of us and little time. So I'm gonna pass it on to Bridge now. Thank you. Um. So Maddie, do you want to talk to us about what Culture Hub does and um, yeah, some of what you've already been doing in the last few weeks also? Sure. Hey everybody, um, my name is Maddie Barbara Bockelman. I uh, work at Culture Hub. Uh, Culture Hub is a global art and technology community that was founded in 2009 by the Seoul Institute of the Arts in Korea and La Mama Experimental Theater Club in New York City. Um, so Culture Hub was born out of these two institutions that were both founded in the early 60s, 
um, and had been collaborating and had very, very close familial relationships. Um, and they had been experimenting and uh, collaborating over distance uh, for, you know, 30 odd years. Um, and in 2009, uh, the two institutions were, were wondering how can we use the internet and emerging technologies to foster more collaboration, creation, um, education and cultural exchange. And so they founded Culture Hub um, to start exploring these things. Um, since then, uh, a lot has happened, but I'm gonna sort of focus on one aspect of what we're doing these days. We support artists and residencies. We do festivals, we produce work. Um, we do professional live streaming, uh, multi-camera. So all of that is really a part of our practice. Like we're a, we do, we do a lot of different things, but um, what I wanna talk about more is our, is our distance collaboration that we've been working on and developing over the past few years. We've been developing a software called Live Lab um, with a creative coder named Olivia Jack. Um, and Live Lab was originally created to, um, to foster distance collaboration. Um, and what I mean when I say distance collaboration is two people who aren't in the same space uh, working together. And so we had at first been experimenting with very expensive and very professional, like a Cisco system, which is like this massive video phone that was basically created to uh, let business meetings happen across the globe. Um, but then we could only call other people who had that very expensive video phone. Um, using something like Google Hangouts or Skype or Zoom is also, was also, we were, we were experimenting with. Um, but we, you know, there wasn't, there isn't a ton of flexibility within those tools because they are made for meetings. Um, they have a predetermined way that they think that human beings will be using their software. Um, and so uh, Google released some code and we started to say, okay, would it be possible to basically make our own audio video routing software? So that's what we're doing. Um, it's, uh, it's we're, we're hoping to release it to the public uh, so that other people can use this software um, in, in, the, in the spring. Um, but what's possible with Live Lab is that it's highly reconfigurable. So I could have um, collaborators in a room and uh, if I was spatialized in a venue, I could be sending Vijay's feed to this projection wall. Um, I could be corresponding with Thea, the technician in a closed system and I wouldn't, wouldn't be seeing her. I could have Yada projected onto the ceiling and Bridget you know, sent to some small TV screen and, and really really integrate with venues and integrate also with education uh, educational spaces. Um, when the whole lockdown happened, um, we realized that Live Lab was gonna become a lot more relevant to everyday people and everyday theater makers and, and artists because um, all of us would be in remote locations and all of us would be wanting to still, well, not all of us, but many of us would still be wanting to make art and share. Um, and so La Mama and Culture Hub basically decided to, uh, start a new performance series. Um, and this goes back to the idea of um, these limitations being actually an exciting moment to experiment um, because it's it's very limited what we could do. Um, and you know we realized we could do online performances. Um, and so now we're using Live Lab to facilitate this new performance series called Downtown Variety, which is happening every Friday night. Um, and yeah, it's a variety show. We're basically bringing in performers from all over New York City and now all over the globe too, um, and having them actively collaborate with our creative technologists who are, uh, we're sort of figuring out a new aesthetic that's coming out of this space so that it's not just like, always this bust shot that we're really getting used to like seeing on everybody. Um, and yeah, we're just trying to explore the possibilities and it's exciting because there's a, like a, a much larger audience um, that's interested in seeing 
seeing stuff in an online venue because uh you know we've been doing this for a while but before it was more geared to facilitate international collaboration um but now it's it's becoming a little more relevant to everyday people um and it's there's always going to be reasons that people can't move uh freely in this world maybe not always but um that they can't cross borders or they can't leave their homes. There's, there's many, many reasons that um, we need to connect over distance and, and critically examine what it means to be connected in, on the internet, especially in, in times of crisis. Um, yeah, and it's, and it's going back to La Mama's roots, which, um, you know, La Mama started as a, by Ellen Stewart in 1961 as a little cafe um, for a few of her brokenhearted friends uh, who wanted to do their plays and didn't have a place. And um, so we're just trying to come in and, and still be a, a venue for artists to share work. And yeah, what we're doing on Friday nights is like three to five minutes of work for everybody. It's, it's very low stakes, very short. So I'll stop talking now and I'll be excited to hear what everybody else is talking about. Thank you, Maddie. And we, Yada and I, we know Vijay from doing um, Medea and Vijay introduced us to um, Maddie and Billy at Culture Hub. So it's just a little bit of the, the linkage here. Um, so Vijay, can you talk to us about kind of your end uh, and your side of, of, of everything? Yeah. Um, so my name is Vijay Matthew. I'm the cultural strategist and a co-founder of HowlRound Theater Commons. And uh, we've been, uh, we're based at uh, Emerson College in Boston, and we've been there since 2012. And what we are is a, a free and open platform for theater makers worldwide um, in order to share conversation and ideas that are disruptive and progressive. And we do that primarily through uh, online platforms. One, one is a, a very active online journal. And then another is a live streaming and video archive platform called HowlRound TV. Um, and our, our primary role at HowlRound is to facilitate contributions from organizations and artists to amplify their local activity, their local events, their local talks, conferences, performances, and amplify that onto uh, a global platform. And we, we are um, field facing. So we, uh, for professional, for, for artists, for theater makers, for performance makers, for organizations um, to come together in a shared space that's owned by us all. Um, and, um, and so we, we've collaborated with, um, you know, on, in a typical year, we'll have about a hundred different live streaming events uh, or even more than that. And then um, also about a hundred different organizations that we're partnering who are producing on the HowlRound TV platform. And, um, and so for example, La Medea was, was a one project that was on HowlRound TV. Um, and also many, um, many times of, we're partnering with a culture hub on several projects every Friday, for example, downtown variety, uh, 8 p.m. on Eastern East Coast time, where um, these are projects that we we love to support because they're um, they're experimenting with the form of performance, and um, but however in the in the U.S. there there are a lot of union issues, and so performances are uh, for the most part the the minority of things that we do on HowlRound TV, the majority of which are conferences and talks like like what we're doing right now. Um, and so in terms of kind of what it looks like practically um, when we partner with an organization or a group of artists to do something is that uh, we will receive an idea of, um, through our contribute content uh, page on howround.com uh, just talking about what the project is. And then what we then do is um, help that organization or group of artists um, figure out how they're going to produce this. Um, just in terms of like what our role will be uh, in terms of building their capacity technically to be able to work with the resources that they have at their disposal. And um, then we create an announcement to help 
um, spread the word to other organizations and artists in our field. And then we, after the event is, is over, we archive that event and make it uh, publicly available so that people who miss the event can still have access to that knowledge. And so we really think of our relationship to the field and to artists as, um, as a, a organization that's really um, there to um, just to gather everyone's contribution so we can collectively grow and learn from each other. Um, and then I guess in terms of like the, the actual practical tools of what we're using. So we have a, an account, an enterprise account with a company called livestream.com. They're now a Vimeo company. And, um, and so that's, that's the, the backend technical uh, live stream platform where all of the video gets live streamed too. And that gets, um, and we're able to embed a live video player um, on howrun.com as well as uh, on the organization's, um, the partnering organization's website if they want that. And also we're able to simulcast to both YouTube and Facebook if that's wanted. And then in terms of the software that's typically used for uh, live streaming, though there are many of these uh, softwares that are able to live stream, one of them that I'd highly recommend to, to any artist out there is to check out uh, OBS Studio, Open Broadcaster Software Studio. It's a free and open source software, very powerful recording and live streaming software um, that's able to, basically the, the, the main idea of it is it, it's able to take many different sources, both audio and video, and you're able to make different scenes or compositions uh, with that, with those different sources. And then you're able to either just record locally if you want to make videos, or you can um, create a live show and have it live streamed out to any uh, live streaming platform of your choosing. So for example, Twitch or YouTube or Facebook, um, or if you have a subscription, a paid script subscription to the various live stream platforms like Vimeo.com or Livestream.com, uh, you're able to do that too. Um, and then I'll just touch on one other thing, which is um, uh, the, the, the kind of experimentation that, um, that you can do and look into using OBS um, while, for example, Live Lab by, by Culture Hub is still in development. Um, I'm personally very much looking forward to that software as a tool that um, can be available to the creative uh, performance community to use um, in a way other than just these kind of typical static boxy kind of uh, live streams while we're in social distancing. But within OBS, you're able to, for example, take a video conference, let's say, for example, on Skype. Um, Skype has a, um, a tool within it called NDI, uh, which stands for Network Device Interface. And what that allows for you to do is to um, break off and split off various video feeds of your participants who are, for example, on a video conference. And then you can take those video feeds within OBS and compose different scenes or looks with those and then live stream that out. Um, and so in a very kind of, in a, in a free way, it's a bit clunky, you can still make something very interesting. And then again, I wanna encourage people to, you know, watch the experimentation of various artists and especially what um, Culture Hub is presenting every Friday night about these examples of what you can do in social um, distancing when everyone is, is not able to be in the same room and what you can do in terms of composing something um, in this in that in this kind of way just really quick from an artist perspective Vijay just showed this program to me very recently and it's very user friendly uh if you love to play if you're editing film already or you're editing has very similar logic and it almost works better than Premiere <laughs> in a weird way but I, I highly recommend it as a tool thank you Vijay um Nell, so uh, we met through the, the dance film world and you've been doing live streaming for a few years now for various companies and various performances and have sort of an expertise on the um, set, you know, setting up your camera and the documentation side of that and what that looks like. So we'd love to hear from you and um, yeah. thanks for joining us. Too. Yeah, 
Thanks. Everybody. Yeah, thank you so much for um, we had such a fun call the other day um, the, with Yara and Brigid. And um, thanks so much um, for just talking. This is such an interesting time. I just to give you a little background. Um, my company is Nell Shelby Productions. I've been um, filming dance for about, I guess, 18 or 19 years now. I um, started as an intern at Jacob's Fellow Dance Festival. So it's been a long time. Um, and my love is documenting performance. That's just, I do anywhere from one to many, many camera shoots, you know, multiple cameras, usually no more than four. Um, and I started live streaming about, I think it was about 10 years ago. Um, Blue Bluesy Dance Theater asked me to live stream the Table of Silence at Lincoln Center. And um, at that time, I, I, so backing up a little bit, I was a broadcast major and I love the idea of live. So that's why I was a broadcast and dance major. And, and I just loved television and loved going live. So this whole idea of live stream just seemed like a complete natural fit for the work that I do. Um, I just would get very energized from it, which all of us are doing live performance. That's why we get energized from that as well. So um, I live streamed, did a one camera shoot. It was probably the most painful thing I've ever done in my life about 10 years ago because internet at Lincoln Center even back then was like not great at all. So we were up all night trying to troubleshoot. Um, so now we do at that space, we still live stream. We're going on our 10th year in September and we do three cameras there. Um, so I, so then from there, I continued to live stream, um, but doing multiple cameras, anywhere from one to, to three, maybe sometimes four cameras. And, um, I am similar to VJ. I now, I used to use livestream.com. I now use Vimeo. Um, and we would then also stream it simultaneously to Facebook, um, with Table of Silence, which I was just telling you about. We've found comfort in continuing to we live stream to YouTube and Facebook live because we feel like there's different audiences on each platform. Um, and we've always streamed to YouTube for the past 10 years. So it just seemed like our audience was there and we liked the engagement, but we actually ended up finding that Facebook live was actually better. We found a lot more engagement on Facebook live. Um, and really it upped our viewership once we moved or once we did simultaneous live streams. Um, and then a, a project that, you know, many, maybe some of you have seen is I live streamed the Cunningham Centennial last April. Um, we live streamed it in London, New York, and um, Los Angeles. And on the same day, different time zones. And we streamed with Vimeo and um, with Vimeo backend and then also went to Facebook Live. And the thing there that I thought was really important is Vimeo was great because we were able to um, put it on the Cunningham website. So, um, and, and so people could go there. It's, you know, a lot of times about people's comfort level. That's actually one thing I sort of wanted to talk about as well. Like that um, on, the, sometimes people like to go directly to the website. Like people found comfort in like going to Cunningham's website, seeing all three of the live streams. Other people really love Facebook. They feel comfortable there. And there was a lot of engagement um, on Facebook. We actually had the Cunningham scholar, Nancy. Um, she was engaging with everyone saying, oh, look, there is this dancer, there's that dancer. Welcome so-and-so to the live stream. And that just brings such an, uh, well, really, I mean, for lack of better words, it brings such a live element. Um, and I think people had a lot of fun doing that. So that's sort of been what I've been doing. You know, I think right now, the past few weeks, as I've, like all of us have been pivoting and adjusting and figuring out sort of like what's next. It's been sort of a, probably like many of the artists that are watching today and all of you that um, for me, my, my work has not been on like online, even though I live stream, it's like I film a live performance that is live streamed. And I will find I, one interesting thing that I really love and excites me right now is I have found resistance in the past from live streaming, sort of what VJ was saying, you know, that there's a lot of like rights issues and things like that, but also just like, oh no, are we going to lose an audience? Those kinds of things, those conversations that a lot of us have, like, will people still come to the theater? 
But the one thing that I think is great now is everyone is like, has no choice but to be comfortable to do this work, whether it's DIY, whether it's once we all get back up and going, whether we're doing live performance, that we now are feeling like this is almost going to be like second nature for all of us. We're all learning at like a rapid speed, whether you've been doing this for a while or not. And um, so what I've been noticing the past few weeks is I've just been answering some very practical questions for people. And I just sort of wanted to sort of go there right now um, before my time runs out. But um, one thing um, that I work a lot with the Department of Education. So you all know that they've been trying to just get everything. These dance teachers have been trying to get things up online. So been talking about framing, which seems like you know, something that you don't think about. Like right now you're seeing, you know, it's very easy. We're sort of all half body, but then like, how do you frame yourself like full body? Um, recently, I just love that Alvin Ailey just put out Revelations. They did like an edit. So if you all haven't seen that, it's super fun. Um, well, actually, no, it wasn't Revelations. It was Rennie Harris's work on Ailey, but um, they probably told their dancers, like you could tell that someone gave them direction put their phone or their laptop a little further back so you can get full body. And um, and so those are things that, to think about. And also the lighting um, is like right now, I actually have a soft box on me. <laughs> um, and I typically don't when I'm on a Zoom call, but I thought I would do that just for today. Um, but, and not everyone's going to have a soft box light. This is the work I do, but there's some really cheap options on Amazon if this is something where you want to start moving into again not no pressure you know at all it's just like there's sometimes some really inexpensive options of just putting up a light in your home and um and then and then also thinking about natural light as well you know if you're outside it's so much easier um and then um so so I think that um one thing another thing that I've just been thinking about also is just taking that imperfect action, like not worried about um, making this perfect. That's what we all do as artists. Like we wanna make everything as good as possible before it goes out on stage. But like right now, like Yara was saying, you know, experimenting and sort of like letting loose and like having fun and being joyful. I think that's what I've been, been trying to do as well. This is making me think so far out of the box. Like to me, a stage dancers is like, what is my comfort level? And that is not possible right now. So then what are we, how are we thinking outside of the box? And, and I, I think another thing that we're also used to as artists is collaborating. So just like picking up the phone and talking to someone and like, I'm trying to figure out how to do this. What do you think? And that's exactly what I did right before this call. I called Ben, who's my live stream tech. And I was like, can we talk for a second? Um, so I think I'll stop there, but um, I think it's a fun time, a really hard time, but I think that there's so much possibility. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I'm gonna bring in some questions that some um, some of you watching have, have asked. Um, the first is sort of related to this, but can anyone talk about how this event was set up? It says powered by Zoom, but it's being hosted on HowlRound. How is it embedded into the website? Yeah, I could talk about that. Um, so this is a, a Zoom Pro account that HowlRound has. Uh, and we have this because we're, we're based at a, a college, Emerson College in Boston. And so that was just kind of the video conferencing platform that they had. And so we decided to use it. And um, one of the things that Zoom Pro is able to do is um, it has a, a feature where you can input an RTMP server and stream key, which is basically just information to tell Zoom uh, where to send the video audio to a live streaming platform of your choice. So uh, we have uh, an account with livestream.com. And so we went to livestream.com to get this RTMP key, and then we put it into Zoom. And then within our Zoom window here, just when we started this, um, this uh, event, um, Thea, who works with us on Haran TV, she just pressed um, go live. And then we started to live stream, send the Zoom call out to livestream.com. And, um, and you're probably viewing this um, on 
a video player iframe um, probably on the Creative Capital website, if I got that right, and also or on howrun.com's website as well. And we'll, um, we'll, we'll make sure because, you know, I work with technology, but I'm, I'm a director, I'm an artist, so I often have trouble understanding the, the, the details. So we'll make sure that we include links to a lot of what we're talking about, uh, just more information and links in our guide on creative capital. So don't panic if you're not <laughs> following. We'll make sure this is a very short session we have, so we'll make sure to include as much as we can in that guide. Another thing to note is that um, Vimeo live stream right now, they're offering to nonprofit organizations and educational institutions um, free, you can fill out a form and the link is on our blog post and you can have a free um, access to, I think their premium level of um, Vimeo live stream. And that is until I believe July um, 2020, July 1st, 2020, as of right now. So that's another sort of resource that's come available and the link is in the blog post. Um, and another if you're question. An independent artist, feel free to reach out to institutions to give you that access. And if also you're an independent artist and don't have access to Zoom Pro, feel free to reach out to the school you went to, any institutions that you've ever collaborated with. This is a time to really reach out to your whole network for that those that access. Um, another. So a few. These are a few questions. So I'm gonna. I'm kind of combining some questions, but um, one is about best kind of sound setup. Um, especially, how, you know, if you're, what kind of mics are there? Also, what are, what are ways to avoid audio latency um, on collaborative video streams? And then partnered with that, um, is a laptop a good option as a, as a uh, camera and a capture device? Or um, should, what are some other options in, in terms of considering um, like what kind of camera to use? So audio and camera. Um, just in terms of, uh, in terms of cameras, you can use professional cameras, but, um, right now I'm using a Logitech web webcam, um, which is, I don't know how, how expensive it is, but it's, um, pretty small and I have it on a, tri a like mini tripod. So it's also very mobile. And so I can do a lot with it, um, just from, so you wouldn't have to like move your whole laptop around. Um, and I also use the sound through there, but now I messed up my little framing. Um, and for audio, it's really about what you have um, available to you, uh, particularly, um, you know, if you're using a MIDI controller interface. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, you can, it, you have to be really aware of like what what you have available to you and uh uh a lot of the times the the webcam sound will actually be okay but if you're using um uh speakers or, or external sound it's best to put that through the stream as opposed to just playing that and then your computer hears it and then sends it away um Is there any, um, in terms of uh, people playing, if there are multiple people who like um, multiple musicians for like uh, performances or any way to best recommend capturing multiple sources of audio? Um, is, is this a question referring to people in different locations? Um, yeah, 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 sorry, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, for, for us right now, like we're, avoiding latency isn't really possible. Like we can get latency lower, but it's it's not possible to have actual, um, like that that becomes a creative challenge that you have to tackle in your in your in your playing. Um, last night we live streamed a, a performance of um, called Raga Makam, which was for artists collaborating in and um, yeah, they just basically incorporated that little delay into their collaboration and it was highly improvisational um and they they went a little bit round robin but um it really became like a, a pleasure to watch them learn and then get get the little bit of uh the funny interactions that would happen the things that went went maybe wrong to to them but it's um 
yeah, I, I think it's it's just important to think about technology as a collaborator and not about not as a something that you can do right or wrong. Like I'm I'm I don't come from a tech background, but I'm working in this setting. So what I like about it is that it requires me to ask a lot of questions, um, and it requires me to just be honest with like where I'm at. And uh, yeah, I mean. I have people that I can ask those questions to. So I would encourage you <laughs> if you had questions to please reach out to us at Culture Hub. Um, yeah. I also to say that if you're broadcasting just you as a musician, uh, we, we had a talk with Twitch last night that was really great because they were taking us through, there's actual backend settings in if you have a Twitch account that you could uh, you could choose to have different kinds of audio settings. Um, that it's, if you don't have microphones or anything else that or have access to getting that stuff, at least you have a little bit of something to work with. And I'm, I, don't, I'm, I don't know about Vimeo yet, but I do know that Twitch does have that ability. Um, so another another question is, um, uh, oh, in terms of also related to sound, but is um, the rights of music, like how to, if you're live streaming and you're live streaming something and you're using music, like, you know, if you, if you were to upload it on Vimeo or on YouTube, it would be blocked because of their copyright claims. So does anyone have any um, experience with that or can, can speak to using the, the rights of music? Yeah, so... Um... So assuming that it's you know fair use, which in most cases when artists are using it in our field, it, it is fair use for copyrighted music. Um, I mean, with some there's some caveats to that, but the way to get around, for example, posting it on YouTube and getting YouTube to then their software to find it and then run ads or some kind of copyright strike or block. Um, there's there's also a a, a platform a nonprofit called Archive.org. Where you can upload it there, and um, they're they're able to provide um, an embeddable video player that you can then take to your own website if you'd like. This is another related question um, in terms of accessibility, but uh, considering widespread inaccessibility of online videos for deaf and hard of hearing due to complexity and costs of live captioning and sign language interpreters, what can artists do to ensure their live live streams are accessible? I I just saw a, a nice example last last night. Um, Solanathon in Chicago was live streaming, and um, they just their admin just they were live streaming on Facebook, and their admin just posted some of the. Um, this is obviously not a big solution, but it's a little little solution. Um, yeah, they were just they were just uh, typing in the comments what the hosts or people were announcing. They were just reiterating also i mean it's it's useful i think for people who learn in different ways or receive information in different ways um it's easy to miss something if if uh i just said it out loud and maybe you were distracted and looking over there or or yeah maybe you are a uh, hard of hearing um yeah they just they would would add information in the comment section and i thought that was really simple but really helpful because i came in in the middle of a performance and I could see, oh, that's this person from this place. Um, and I appreciated that. One thing that, um, that has also come up is that uh, in terms of the way that these of audiences interact is that um, once your once you kind of build an audience that's interacting with you, they also become a collaborator. And so they'll start explaining to people what's happening or what's going on. So as the artist, you're not also responsible for doing that too. So that's something else that can grow out of like interactive community and where you start to have a, a bigger following on a live streaming platform. This like part particularly came out of our conversation at, with Twitch and that that's sort of part of what happens from um, the uh, building of those communities is that the, uh, your audience starts to support you in that way and can help um, people who are like unfamiliar, like, oh, what's going on here? And say, oh, this is what this is. So, um, Rich, another just got example a text of that. From Pamela, one of our collaborators, who says that Jam Kazam takes care of delay for musician collaborators. So I don't know if anyone's used it, but maybe it's a good uh, resource. We'll add it to the guide. Thanks, Pamela. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I think we I'm, we have time for is one more question. Um, okay, so this is a question about for artists just starting out streaming with a large viewership. 
what is your advice for beginning to build interactive elements into a stream within the limitations of a small audience, which can often restrict the amount of interaction possible? Um, so I think that I can only answer it from our experience, but something that I think is key is to know where, where first what your work is and what your work is trying to say. So the plat different platforms have different functions and they work almost like theater venues or concert venues where like some venues feel like a black box, others feel like a, a proscenium. So it just depends the energy that you wanna give to the work, if it's a workshop, if it's something you're just messing around with. But the other thing to think about as far as like, if your work is interactive, something that we really thought about with Medea is, okay, well, where is our, our audience living? And can we bring that audience to another space? So, you know, if most of your audience sees your work through theater platforms, maybe that's your community. Maybe you wanna play with going into spaces that the theater audience is already familiar with. So going to where your audience already is. And then if you wanna go into another platform like we did with Twitch, we basically just kind of asked our audience to come with us to Twitch. But what we really found was a new audience at Twitch, which was interesting. But I think it is sort of focusing on the work first for us. And then depending what the work needs, for us the work needed interactive conversation that first go around. Uh, the second go around, we were really excited to work in a more formal space like HowlRound. So that was really interesting as well. So it just depends what the work needed. And then bringing the audience that we already had cultivated, for example, an Instagram to the more formal space of, of, you know, of another platform. Um, so I think that was a key thing for us. Mm -hmm. um, so, this is this is coming to the end of our our little conversation here about live streaming. Um, just want to say thank you to uh, Creative Capital, thank you to Jay and HowlRound and to Thea, and thank you Maddie and Nell for joining us. Um, a quick shout out to everybody. You know, check out Culture Hub and their um, their downtown downtown variety on Fridays. Um, also, HowlRound is doing so many things right now. They have something at five, so you can just keep on going. Um, and now we'll also be offering, um, I think one-on-one -on -one brainstorming sessions. So you can um, reach out to Nell and we'll have um, links to all this also in that blog post. Yeah, and we um, have information as well in the guide about all the different platforms and a bunch of stuff in there that we weren't able to get to here. Thanks everybody. And if you haven't checked out uh, our website yet, creative-capital.org, um, we've been collecting a long list of artist resources there. So um, yeah, I encourage you to take a minute to look. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.